and I am going to welcome all of you to today's ULBLC session on open educational resources with Melody Root and Sam Harlow. Um, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to them, but just as a reminder, or if you are here for the first time, which I don't think anyone is, but you just never know, um, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions. I will be monitoring the chat as our presenters are talking. Um, so if you have questions or, or comments or anything that comes up, please feel free to use the chat. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Jenny. So um, Sam and I are going to be talking about uh, what we've been doing the past year with OER. So some updates on that, um, some projects that we worked on as well, and then what, what's going to happen in the future with OER at UNCG. So. And you all know me and Sam. I don't think we need to introduce ourselves. So, uh, so open educational resources. I don't want to spend too much time going into like what OER is because I feel like there's a lot of um, we've done that presentation a lot. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there for you, but I do want to do a refresher. Um, so here we have um, this uh, definition from Spark Open. And it says, OER are teaching, learning, and research resources that are free of cost and access barriers, and which also carry legal permissions for open use. Generally, the permission is granted by uh, use of an open license. And I like this definition because it sort of gets the like free access barriers part, but then it also emphasizes the, and it has this legal permission that is used. So this is like what really separates OER from just like free stuff that you find online, right? Uh, is that it has that Creative Commons license. So generally we uh, define OER um, by its ability to um, um, utilize the five R's. And just for um, um, a refresher, the five R's are reuse, which means that content can be reused um, like in a classroom, you can put it on a website, that kind of stuff, uh, retain. So you can have copies of the uh, content for personal ar archives or uh, reference. So basically like downloading a copy of it to your, to your computer. Um, revise, which uh, means modifying, altering it in some way. That includes like translations. Uh, remix, which is when content can be adapted uh, with similar content. So sort of a collage of different types of open content that you put together. Um, and then redistribute, which means you can share it with anybody else. You can give a copy of it to your friend. Um, so those are the five R's that sort of make OER OER. And uh, that is pretty much made possible through Creative Commons. So uh, most OER is made possible through this type of licensing. And I am not a like copyright expert, but basically, <laughs> Uh, the gist of it is that uh, we have this sort of scale between copyright and public domain. So on the far left here, we have copyright, which is all rights reserved. Um, so this re, uh, uh, requires uh, permission every single time from the copyright owner. So uh, copyright is something that happens automatically. You don't have to register some, something to be copyrighted as long as it is um, creative and put in a fixed form it is copyrighted. So if you were to write a poem uh, and you just like put it on your blog or something, even if you don't say this is copyrighted materials, it's automatically copyrighted to you because uh, it's an original uh, piece of work and it's fixed in that uh, form that it can be read online. Um, so that is copyright. So that is why when you see things online that like don't have any sort of uh, licensing on it. It doesn't ma mean that it's automatically free to use. Uh, it could potentially have a copyright. It's just not listed on there. So then we have public domain, which means that there are no rights reserved. And this means that nobody owns the thing. It is um, also referred to as a CC zero. Um, and that means you can do whatever you want with it. And there are certain like, uh, things that make something go into the public domain. So someone can dedicate their work into the public domain or it, their copyright could expire and then reach the public domain. So I think last year, like the great Gatsby entered the public domain 
So now anybody who wants to make like a Great Gatsby movie or like make a Great Gatsby movie with cats, they can do that and they don't have to get permission from anybody for doing that. And then in the middle, we have Creative Commons, which is some rights are reserved. And basically that means uh, depending on the type of licensing, uh, you can reuse it uh, without permission under the specific Creative Commons license that the person has added. So there's different ones, you've probably seen them. There's like the CC BY, which means like, you could do whatever with this, but you have to attribute me. So there's still a copyright owner with Creative Commons, uh, but they are picking and choosing how you can use their work without you having to contact them or get permission from them. So hopefully that makes sense sort of a scale in between, uh, you know, fully uh, all rights reserved copyright and public domain. All right, so just some quick um, common OER misconceptions. And I'm sorry, I'm actually gonna turn my video off because it's kind of distracting me. Um, <laughs> sorry, so some common OER misconceptions. So the first one is The Great Catsby. Wow, why did I not think of that? That's amazing. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so the first one is OER are just free resources online. And like I just mentioned, um, that is not true. Uh, uh, while OER should be free um, and accessible and you know, able to uh, like read freely and redistribute freely, uh, it has to have that uh, licensing that makes it uh, OER. So it's not just like anything that you find uh, online or anything that you create um, and that you don't specify is uh, available through um, um, Creative Commons. So the second one is that all OER is digital and this is also false. So copyright, or I'm sorry, um, OERs generally start off in a digital form uh, but they don't need to remain that way to still be uh, accessed or shared openly. So you could create like a zine and put a Creative Commons license on it. And you can have a digital form, but you could also have a form that you can like print out and share with people. So it's not always digital. The third one here is that OER are lower quality than traditional textbooks. And this is also false. Um, so I know that the, this is like um, a big thing in OER conversations because the idea is like, well, anyone can create an OER and how are we peer reviewing that kind of thing? Um, I will say that uh, some of the most major OER textbook distributors have a peer reviewed process. And there's just been a lot of studies that show that students traditionally um, or generally uh, find their OER replacements to be uh, just as effective, if not more effective than their traditional textbooks. And there's a lot of studies that support that uh, student success and just like academic uh, achievement uh, uh, is higher with um, OER materials. And then finally, we have all claims of open follow the five R's. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky because the word open, you probably have noticed, um, has been used in some confusing ways. Uh, so there's this term called open washing um, and it's basically having the appearance of being open sourced or openly licensed uh, for marketing purposes while still continuing proprietary practices. So basically it's, it's the illusion of being open, but you're still paying for something. Um, so that is something to always consider. If, if something is claiming to be open, but like you're still having to pay for it, then there's a possibility that it's open washing. Um, and then another similar tactic that is being used is open wrapping, which occurs when um, publishers will provide uh, open materials, but it's sort of prepackaged with something that you have to buy. So, uh, you know, it could be an open textbook, but the like ancillary materials, um, data analytics, that kind of thing um, are still proprietary. So these are things that, uh, are worth looking out for and you know noticing. Um, I think it's something that um, OER advocates are noticing happening sort of with like the publishing world. So open washing, washing and open wrapping are things. Um, and then finally, like if we're talking about claims of open, uh, if we follow, if, 
if all open materials OER follow the five R's, then technically anything with a non-derivatives Creative Commons license would not apply because with a non-derivatives, you can't make changes to the work, which means that uh, it's technically uh, not something that you can revise or remix. So this is something that uh, people debate on, on whether something with a non-derivative Creative Commons license should be considered OER or not. Personally, that's not a hill that I want to die on, but uh, I will just say that um, from conversations that I've had with other OER people, that um, a non-derivative license uh, is something that provides some protections for minoritized content creators who want to make their work freely available, but they don't necessarily want people to appropriate or change their words in harmful ways. So that is something to consider. And you know, not everything that is fully open is inherently good, um, especially if it's just freely sharing um, views that are considered to be problematic. Uh, so that would not be something that is considered good naturally, even if it is fully openly licensed. All right, so uh, now that we went over some OER basics and some misconceptions, we're gonna be talking about what we've been doing. And for that, I will turn it over to Sam. Okay, so I dropped the link to the slides in the chat. So um, there's links to these slides in those slides. Uh, so feel free to uh, open them up and look at them. But we participated in ADAPT 2021, which was a virtual online conference put on by the UTLC, ITS, um, sorry, there's a bird right there. Uh, the UTLC, ITS, uh, UNCG Libraries, I helped do some of the planning. And um, I feel like I'm missing one. Oh, academic ITCs. Um, so uh, this was really sessions on like virtual professional development, um, not all about online learning. They had tracks such as research, uh, EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, teaching, and more. So this one actually OER, Open Pedagogy and Social Justice was on the EDI track and the panel of librarians and faculty who have been doing open pedagogy projects. So open pedagogy is this idea of getting rid of um, uh, something we call disposable assignments, right? These assignments that don't really add value to the world um, are, are hard to grade, frustrating to grade, right? These long research papers that really don't fit into the student learning objectives that the students are not gonna ever think about again in their life um, as something valuable. So really coming up with this idea of making more authentic um, assessments, authentic assignments, um, so some examples of open pedagogy that were brought up in this panel were um, a music class that had their students create a digital online textbook on, I think it was on ear training. Uh, so that's one example. Another one that has come up at UNCG is for students to create digital timelines of sports coaches, um, specifically female identifying sports coaches, um, because there's not many um, representations of female sports coaches in that way. Um, the last one was with Maggie Murphy and uh, Elizabeth per Perrell from the art history department, and they talked about their work. They've done some um, Wikipedia edit-thons where students edit or add uh, Wikipedia entries for underrepresented artists um, and other projects as well. They work really closely with the um, Digital Act Studio, uh, you know, to do these projects. So check it out. Um, on those slides, there's also links to like, you know, um, other things that people have done and more information about open pedagogy. If this is a conference that seems interesting to you that you missed, um, you can go to the link on there that says check out what else went on in this conference and it will give you a schedule. Um, you will have to be added into a Canvas course that to get access to the materials, um, but feel free to do that. It's on there and open uh, to use. So if you're interested in the recording though, I do have the recording in box, but that link right there is I think to the slides, which gives you the, the general idea of what's going on uh, with that if you wanna learn more. 
So some other things that have been going on that are kind of continuous for those of you who have been to these OER talks before, um, but also to give some shout outs, really good work um, and some new projects that we've kind of shifted into in the last year is that as always, um, huge shout out to Michelle Courtney who couldn't be here today. Uh, I think she's on vacation at the beach. So um, I hope she is enjoying the beach. I, I wish I was at the beach, but um, Thank you to Michelle, who um, has always been doing something about called course adapted text, where if we see a textbook that we can get in an ebook, unlimited ebook format, uh, we buy it from the library and then we make it available on this guide that is linked here. And Michelle works to email all the faculty and say, hey, just to let you know, we have your textbook available as an unlimited ebook. Um, so this saves the students a lot of money um, and is really popular. We've gotten really good feedback. Uh, so check that out. That will be continuing. Um, and then another thing that we've started having Michelle do in the last about year um, in the pandemic is that we've had her be adding to the OER by subject guide. Um, so if you click on there um, and go out to it, we already have links to all the subjects, right? So we have one for biology, um, sociology, accounting and financing. You can see all of it. So if you click on one of the subjects, you can see here that we now have specific links to open text uh, that could be good for various aspects of biology. Michelle has done all of this work. So it started out by having liaisons, maybe say, I recommend looking through these repositories with these kind of keywords. Um, so Michelle did that initial work. And then moving forward in terms of workflow, we get, we're on a variety of OER listservs. And when we see a new OER um, text be published or some kind of open text be published, in a general area, we will forward it to Michelle and the liaison to let them know, and then we will add it to these guides, um, especially if the liaison looks at it and says, yeah, I really think this would be good for like media studies and uh, WGS and uh, English kind of thing. So just an example, it can be put in multiple places. So again, uh, maybe Michelle will watch this recording, maybe not, but uh, this is all Michelle. She's great. So um, another thing is that just in case you hear about it around campus and to know that Melanie and I have heard about it, but, um, you know, uh, are uh, still like in progress, still learning more. So we don't know a whole lot, but there are two things going on on campus that kind of are like OER related, but not quite OER, um, but something called first day where um, students have to opt out of having their textbooks automatically purchased for them. So this was in pilot mode um, through Brian school, and then it will continue and be more widespread in the fall. Last I heard, um, but we do remember have a new provost coming in. The new provost is very OER um, positive, very OER fluent. Uh, she, uh, it was a big part of her CV, if you looked, that she did huge initiatives through her campus. So again, a lot of this could be in flux based on that. Another thing that you might see or hear about, just to give you a heads up, is that Barnes and Nobles has an OER adoption option when you, uh, as a faculty member or instructor teaching a class, where when uh, you, if you, they ask you for a textbook, right? You get an email and it says, do you have a textbook for your class? And when you do that, you can go on there and say, I have no textbook. And then they, I think tag it as OER. So Melody and I like haven't been able to really get in touch with them to see what they're doing with this data, how they're kind of uh, thinking through this data. Um, I think they're just trying to kind of know how many faculty use textbooks or not. But remember, as Melody told you, just because you don't use a textbook doesn't mean it is a truly OER course. Um, so uh, again, we're learning, we're figuring things out. Uh, so again, just in case you hear about these things on campus, just to know Melody and I, have heard about it. We uh, are kind of waiting and seeing with the new provost and trying to learn what we can as they uh, move forward, but they are like brand new stuff. Okay, now are you gonna talk about this one, Melody? Yeah, I can talk about it if that's cool. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the UNC system as a whole is putting a lot of consideration and funds into um, open education. So you're probably uh, familiar with ULAC, uh, which is the University Library Advisory Committee, which is, um, from what I understand, generally made up of uh, library deans. I think Mike serves on it. Um, so they created this subcommittee um, called ORC, O-A-R-C, which stands for Open and Accessible Resources Committee. And um, basically, this is a committee of um, 
OER representatives from different UNC institutions um, who come together and uh, basically what they do is they bring proposals to the greater ULAC um, committee to try and make institutional change on a system level as it relates to students, access, and affordability. So obviously that would um, relate a lot to OER. So that is something that I am currently serving on. Um, it's a brand new subcommittee. Um, and yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of, uh, we have a lot of big plans. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, not only that, but the UNC system received a lot of funding to create what, um, what are known as the UNC course enhancement collections, which Sam and I both worked on in 2020, um, as well as Anna and David, I believe. Um, so essentially this is, um, what this is was uh, faculty and librarians across the UNC system uh, came together in the summer and fall of 2020 to curate and create these openly licensed courses that would support both online and in-person instruction. Um, so the collections were designed around high demand courses that would have sort of a high impact to use these. Um, and they, they considered uh, high demand courses across different UNC uh, system institutions. So I'm gonna just click on this link real quick. So this information exists in two places and this is one of the places and this is its sort of own landing uh, space on this website. Uh, but uh, all of the collections are available on OER Commons as well and I'll show you that in a second. But you can see here, there's just general information about what the course enhancement collections are. And then you can go down here and then there's these collections here. And I'm just gonna show you what one looks like as an example. So I'm gonna click on this, uh, maybe this general biology one here. And you can see it is um, taking you to this Google site here. Uh, yeah, Sam worked on this one. Great, I, I, Sam, I love this one. Um, I'm a big fan of it. So you can see uh, it has some uh, general information about uh, the course, there's an overview section. And then if you click on the modules, uh, it has all of the modules listed here. And this one actually, I believe, um, takes you to um, a Google folder. So you can click on that information and then you have this entire module that you can use in your class and all of it is openly licensed. So you can do whatever you want with it. Um, so that's very cool. Um, and then if you were to go back here, uh, there's this enhance your course uh, section here. And this is where they uh, host their like documentation, which also includes a faculty resource guide. So each of these courses have a faculty resource guide. And it basically just lays out how to use the course. Um, it talks about like the fact that it's open. Uh, it's sort of an overview of what students can learn from it. There's the uh, learning objectives and different uh, chapters that might be included in it. So it's very cool. Are they updated each year semester? Um, that, that's a good question, Sarah. I think it's one of those things that we're still working on because they are so new. We're considering um, um, sustainability of these things. Um, but I do think that they are sort of made for general courses and not like like very specific courses. So uh, even if it isn't updated each year, the information is stuff that isn't like constantly changing. So it could still be used. But yeah, this is just an example of the um, um, faculty resource guide here. Um, and uh, folks put a lot of work into it. So here we just have sort of the like metadata laid out. Um, but yeah, this is something that Sam and I both worked on last year. Um, <laughs> Sam made that spreadsheet. Go Sam, way to go. Um, yeah, so lots of, lots of good stuff. But that is just, uh, you know, uh, one thing that the UNC system is doing. And like I said, these were created last summer and into the fall. And um, now uh, um, ORC, the, the committee I was just mentioning, is sort of in the process of like, how do we now uh, 
teach our institutions about these things and um, sort of market these uh, course enhancement collections to faculty across different UNC institutions. So that is an ongoing project. And then because the uh, course collections all use OER, uh, the UNC system wanted to make sure that there was a course on OER, so an OER basically on OER, that helps faculty understand uh, what they can do with a course collection. So this is what I worked on um, in the fall, and that is the OER implementation collection. So I'm going to click on that, and that is what you see here. Um, so you can see there's an introduction to the collection, there's the modules, the faculty resource guide. These are all the people that worked on it. It was all mostly librarians. Um, and uh, it coincided with these webinars that were happening at the same time called the Open Fridays OER webinar series, um, where Sam actually uh, is one of the speakers on this, but you can see there's uh, different presentations. Um, and this was created to supplement this course. So um, that is really cool that it has the video aspect as well. And uh, you can go and look at our uh, faculty resource guide, which explains sort of the creation and how to use um, the different modules. So let's look at some of the modules. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to have the modules um, basically answer some of the most common questions that we get from faculty. Um, you know, at first we had these sort of like learning objective module titles that were uh, that you just kind of used academic jargon and then eventually we just boiled it down to like, what are the big questions that we get asked and those are sort of the the what why's, the where's and the how's. So uh, if you go to uh, this module, um, you can see there's information on what OER is it uh, mentions the learning objectives right here at the top. You can scroll down, get the information, and then there's attributions. And the great part about this is that it, um, it builds on the knowledge from the previous module, but if you already have that specific knowledge, you can just skip and go to whatever um, module you want to. So if you just, um, you feel like you understand what OER is and like why you should use OER, but maybe you just want to know how you can adapt existing OER, then you can go to module five and use that. Um, so this was something that I worked on um, last fall. So this is really cool. Um, uh, these are things that uh, exist now on UNC Systems um, Hub on OER Commons. So that is also new. Uh, so I'm going to click on that. So OER Commons, for those of you who are not familiar, is an OER repository. And UNC, the UNC system has its own hub on the um, repository now. And so you can see uh, this is all of the same things that I just showed you on that um, UNC system landing page, but it's sort of laid out a little bit nicer. It's a little bit cleaner, but when you click on it, it's going to take you to um, the OER uh, repository, OER Commons page. So for example, we're going to go to the general biology one and you can see uh, there's the UNC system general biology digital course right there, and it shows you the uh, CC license. It's a CC by, um, so very open, and you can see the folks who worked on that as well. So that is the uh, UNC system um, uh, open collections that they've created for uh, faculty to use across university systems. All right, let me look at the chat. Yeah, it's it's really great stuff. Um, very cool. Yes, and Anna and David did um, help out with this project. They were involved as well. Um, it was great. Um, I had a really great time working on it. Uh, it was a lot of work. I think we had, for my group, we had three synchronous uh, commitments every single week uh, where we had to meet um, on top of, you know, doing a lot of curating and vetting and creating the modules on our own time. So. Um, but it was it was a really, really great experience. Yeah, and it was super nice to work with North Carolina librarians and faculty across the system and sort of just network and get to know different people. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sam, who's going to talk about our OER modules. Yes, I'm back. So um, 
I think a lot of you have already heard about this, but just to make sure that we're all on the same play page, but in the, we've been working on this for years. I've been here, believe it or not, almost uh, four years. I'm trying to think, I try to think about it from when May was born. But anyway, I've been here almost four years. And since I came here, we were always talking about revising PATH, which was our suite of research tutorials. That was great, um, but just needed some updating. And so we have a new system for our research tutorials. So if you haven't checked them out, um, definitely do that. Um, again, I know a lot of you all here have seen it, but just to make sure, um, here they are, I'm dropping them in the chat. Um, but it's a whole suite. So the way it's broken down is that we wanted these to be very flexible where we could add to them. Um, it wasn't as much in chronological order and we could have things in different categories. So we have a getting started and an advanced kind of deal with the research modules. So the getting started one is usually used for our like information literacy instruction and matches our student learning objectives, our information literacy student learning objectives. Um, and Jenny's here if you have questions about those, but they're linked on the research page. Um, but we also have an advanced section that's meant for more graduate level work or for faculty. And what we decided to do is add a uh, suite of modules um, on open educational resources. So these are on a lot of the stuff that Melody talked about, but a little bit more flushed out. And the categories are, um, I'm going to go to my I think finding, finding, evaluating, creating, teaching. Uh, so if you click on them, yeah, there they are, sorry. Uh, they uh, are just, you know, like tech, they're all of these um, go by the same kind of system. We create them in Google Docs and then um, build them within the platform that uh, shout out to Eric helped, uh, they built it and we uh, use it very happily, uh, particularly Richard and Vanessa uh, who, who really built this system. We're very lucky to have this great homegrown system. So it's text, you know, introduction, and then we usually have some kind of multimedia visual component. And then they end with something called Quick Checks, uh, which we create using something called H5P, which is an open source free tool um, online that just creates these little inner um, low stake interactions. They're not graded. They don't track any data. Uh, they're just fun questions to kind of engage the user. Uh, but if you go through the whole thing, it does end in a quiz. And then the quiz, if you take the quiz, you can take it as many times as you want. Uh, you do get a certificate by creating, by doing each module in this suite, uh, we call it a tutorial. So the, the boxes like Melody is in a module right now are in a tutorial and then a tutorial produces a certificate. So this is now a required element of our OER mini grants where faculty have to uh, give us a certificate of, of completion for taking these four modules on OER. Um, we like this a lot and we're hoping this goes well. This is our first year that we'll be doing this. Um, because it kind of, um, we can do these workshops for winners of the OER mini grants where faculty get $1,000 to eliminate uh, a textbook in their course. Uh, but then we really have no way of assessing how much they really absorbed and learned about OER. And then we don't really know how much they're becoming like OER advocates in the process. And these are what we call like OER light grants in that they're not required to use all OER material. Uh, as long as they eliminate a textbook, it's fine. So they could of course link to library articles, library resources, which are not really OER, right? Because the library is paying money for them, even though it's free for the students. Um, but their student fees are paying for it. You know, it's a web of a web of money. So anyway, um, so far we have had a couple of the faculty already send us them. Um, they're due in August, uh, but we've had, you know, no like usability issues come up. They've sent us a certificate uh, pretty easily, uh, and that's it. So uh, keep that in mind. And uh, if you have any questions or ideas or thoughts on these research tutorials, let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, because we again, we can add to them at any time. So I don't, I don't know who, who's talking about this one. We both, we both. Oh uh, yeah, we can both talk about it. Uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's kind of just a, <laughs> a plug. But we, uh, Sam and I, uh, wrote a chapter for an upcoming book on. Um, sort of the connection between OER, social, just, social justice, and EDI. Um, and this is our title of our chapter. It's OER, social justice, and online professional development to enhance EDI. Um, essentially um, focuses on sort of the things that we've done uh, 
for professional development to sort of connect OER to social justice and EDI. Yeah, and particularly to the online component, you know, shifting COVID, I think our chapter has some statistics about how stressful COVID was for students and faculty. Um, so how we pivoted in that time, but also that we'll continue to do some of this stuff, right, in terms of accessibility and flexibility um, as well. Yeah, so that is something that is um, upcoming. Um, yeah, and it also included um, some of the stuff we did around open pedagogy and considering representation. Um, so um, a big sort of like movement in uh, OER is to sort of consider how it uh, has creates a lot of opportunity for um, representation um, as well as just EDI um, initiatives beyond saving students money. So it's also an opportunity to um, create uh, information and to change the academic canon to be a little less uh, um, like cis white Western perspective kind of thing. So um, it, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think that that is um, um, a really great direction that uh, OER is going into. So we sort of talked about um, that as well in the chapter. All right. So um, Sam, do you want to I talk did, about this? Yeah, I did add this kind of stuff. Sorry, Melody, just at the beginning, because we didn't, I realized as I was like tweaking the slides at like 1030, as I do, um, we didn't really talk about OER mini grants, but I did want to be clear that that they're still going that right as of now there ha hasn't changed anything in terms of how we run those or do them. Um, so we have 13 winners for the 21 22 year, uh, they will receive their stipends uh, at, in late July Ro shout out to Robin who has been very helpful in terms of the stipends and uh, the organization and the workflow of these grants. Uh, so really the pandemic uh, didn't really influence this we did our workshop. Uh, that we do for OER mini grants, we promoted them, um, and we got about the same, about as many applicants as we usually do. Um, and again, the only thing to shift in terms of this to think through is that, you know, now that we have a new provost coming in, again, um, we'll have to make sure the funding's there. But if anything, we're, we're you know, I don't want to say we're overly confident. I don't ever like being overly confident, but we're pretty confident that based on her CV and like the work she's done with OER in the past, they're definitely going to agree to do the funding because what we do right now is we split the funding um, with uh, the provost office. So, um, you know, I think about half or maybe a little less than half uh, comes from the library and then the rest comes from the provost office. So we have to have their permission each year to do this. Um, and again, it's just for faculty to eliminate a textbook. Um, and we have a website on it if you want to look at um, past winners. And I do want to note um, one thing that I thought was cool that I don't even think like Melody, you and I have talked about that much, but like our winner last year won the online, one of our winners last year won um, that online learning excellence award that they give out. And a big part of their application process, the reason they got it was their um, conversion to OER in a pretty large math course. So again, it can be a really great opportunity uh, for faculty in a lot of different ways. Um, so next though, um, we're gonna talk about this ODR, o EDI curriculum revision grant. I think that's the name we settled on. And Melody, you can talk about that. I just wanted to say that the OER mini grant is not going away. It's still, it's still there. Yeah, so, um, and we have Sarah here, so she can um, add in anything if she wants to in the chat, or you can even unmute yourself. But um, basically um, the uh, music department uh, had this sort of goal to revamp their curriculum. And a big part of that was sort of decolonizing their curriculum to be, um, you know, what I was mentioning earlier, uh, less of that um, like male, white, cis, heteronormative uh, uh, perspective that we're so used to in um, sort of typical music curriculum. Um, and as part of that, they wanted to use OER. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this was something that um, required a little bit more, um, would require a little bit more funding because if it's a, if it's a department doing it and there's, you know, five plus people who want to apply, you know, that's, that's almost half of our mini grant. So basically um, uh, we worked 
with Mike and sort of uh, coming up with this new type of grant that would allow uh, them to get that money and that support. Um, but the the what makes it different is that it requires sort of a larger revamping of a curriculum. And we really wanted to sort of like focus on the fact that um, it had this like major EDI initiative that aligns with university like strategic goals as well. Um, so that is how this uh, new grant um, got started. And it, it we just did it this one time and we're still sort of working out like sort of the sustainability and the future of this um, um, EDI and OER grant. But uh, yeah, that's sort of what's happening. Um, so the potential for this um, is great because, you know, like it could just be something that the music department through like word of mouth tell other people about. But then, you know, there's like, there are some issues of like, we can't just like, we don't have all the money in the world to give out to people, unfortunately. So um, we're still considering things, but um, it does mean that there is potential for more involvement with liaisons uh, because this is not just like a one course, uh, like replacing a textbook situation. This is a whole um, revamping of the curriculum. So Sarah, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, actually, um, one of the things that that has come up in the meetings that I've been in with the music faculty is um, that there's also a Mac element, you know, so it's not, the discussions have been um, for years, you know, the ethnomusicologists, you know, had, this is what they do. They, they do um, the rest of the world from the canon and the rest of time from the canon. So, so, and and most of the musicologists are on board with with this. It's just it's hard to do if you've been doing teaching something for a long time with a certain textbook, blah blah blah. Um, but they're so ready to do it. Everybody is on board, and it's um, uh, really exciting to be working with people that I've known for years who are you know making a difference in how they're going to teach and. Um, so some of it is is textbook related and OER related. So that so having both OER and EDI makes sense in the name of what's going on. But also, um, I'm 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 interested in just FYI, and we can talk about this later. The whole possibility of what what some of the people come up with can be loaded to the UNC system site. Like, I think that this is a potential to actually get music on that list. You know of all those subjects and that there's no music there, but maybe we can work on that. So I'm very excited about all of this and stay tuned. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to talk about how this sort of evolved. Yeah, um, yeah, Sarah, I think that's a good idea. And, you know, I think we kind of said this and the, the OER Commons Hub, it's still like, it's so new and um, there's still some questions. And again, Melody, you might know more about this than me in terms of like, how are we going to put stuff in there moving forward? How are new categories? Because that initial project was for high enrollment, really STEM courses, um, as you see from the categories. You know, and then again, there has been talks about like humanities, adding in other categories. So, um, Melody, do you know anything about how to add stuff there? That is something that we are like going to be trained on soon through ORC, I believe, because um, I will be the like OER Commons like representative, I guess, for UNCG through my connection to the um, Open and Accessible uh, Resources Committee. Awesome. Um, so stay tuned. Cool. And um, just to be uh, clear, we like wrote a proposal for this kind of new fund line. And again, it's really a matter of waiting for this new roast who, again, is, is this her first day in July? I don't, I don't know. I'm not that high up. So I don't know. But, <laughs> and we're pretty confident she can, she's going to love it. Right. And, and then it's going to move forward. So something to keep in mind, uh, if you work with faculty, if you work with departments, liaisons, archivists, um, any library, you know, where you work on committees with faculty, this is something um, I would like to start thinking about. Um, again, we don't really know how yet we're gonna promote it. We're kind of waiting to see how it goes with music. Like hopefully it goes great. And then we'll be like, have this group of people who can be like, 
yes, we loved this. This was great, you know, that we can put on panels and, you know, like that kind of thing. But if you are a liaison or an archivist or anyone working with faculty and you've heard wind of, you know, these kind of uh, curriculum revamps, um, it could be something that you start talking about, you know, meeting with Melody, um, meeting with, uh, uh, you know, us and thinking through it. Um, the way we did it in the past, and again, this came back very organically, but we're hoping that again, that it would be more departments moving forward. Um, but if you know of anything, it's not too early to like email Melody and start thinking through this, you know, and say like, you know, I've heard wind, so like, you know, I want to have a meeting. And so as, you know, Melody said, this could mean more involvement from liaisons and we're working with that. And I think we would really want feedback. If, if it's too much, if it's not, you know, if you're not feeling enough support, let us know so we can pivot with that as well. So can I jump in and just yeah. re shout out back to y'all, back to Sam and Melody. Um, this really did grow organically out of a meeting that we had and, and and it started with one of your presentations and there were two or three music faculty there and then then it was like whoa let's like oh let's do this all together and 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 Sam was like yeah so yeah thank you y'all this is really awesome and i think it's really helping to coalesce the the challenge that's that's upon the music folks thank you Thank you. And I made this slide at the last minute just to kind of wrap it up before we talk about our final thing um, in that, you know, we gave you a lot of stuff about OER today. I can hear my three-year-old yelling at me, sorry. So I'll make this quick. But um, OER, like we gave you a lot and I sometimes get this question from liaisons and sometimes not. This is of course, not, I don't, I am no one's boss. This is not a requirement. But sometimes you have the question of like, what can I do? How can I, I like OER. I like the idea of OER. What ways I could get involved? Um, and so here are just some things to think through. Again, not at all a requirement, but like OER advocacy with both students and instructors, um, OER content on um, guides, OER in syllabuses. And then OER events are not just for OER and online learning librarians, um, they're for um, everyone. There's really great stuff about social justice and open education and a lot of these, um, and also subject specific ideas, projects, faculty come and talk about what they're doing with their curriculums. They're very, and they're typically free, if not free, very affordable. Um, and let, usually now they're, um, they're uh, virtual. So keep that in mind um, and I will go quiet so that um, May, I can deal with, uh, this is May. Say hi, May. May doesn't feel well, <laughs> sorry. Oh. All right, so, um, so some changes that are happening um, in the future to, to be aware of. So UNCG Libraries has always had OER leadership. Um, you probably know that uh, Beth uh, sort of paved the way in a lot of aspects for um, um, OER initiatives in North Carolina, but we've never really had an official OER librarian. And through some conversations, um, uh, we decided to change this. So I'm going to be transitioning into the official OER librarian position. Um, so my title will be student success and OER librarian. And this kind of happened um, I guess kind of organically. Um, so I am currently finishing up my certification um, in OER librarianship um, through the Open Education Network. And my, like through my cohort, I sort of noticed that there was um, a lot of uh, people with position titles like student success in OER librarian or like diversity resident for um, open education, uh, open educational resources. Um, yeah, and as part of that um, course, um, I had to have a conversation with Mike. And so we, we started talking about um, uh, if there would ever be an official OER librarian position at UNCG. Um, I kind of mentioned that I had noticed these like joint titles um, of different places. And then Mike uh, really liked that idea and wanted me to pursue that. So um, we are transitioning into that. Um, so, what that means is that, um, you know, it, it's sort of a transition that's happening this summer and we kind of wanted to get it going so that uh, 
um, I can eventually uh, get in front of the provost. You know, obviously we probably are not going to um, set anything up anytime soon because she's got so much that she has to do. But eventually, um, I will be talking with her. But um, we sort of wanted that transition to happen um, to prepare for that. Um, and basically, uh, yeah, it's 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 going to be. Um, I would like to think it's going to be sort of an organic transition where, you know, it's not going to be an overnight thing. Um, Sam is uh, already helping me in so many ways to sort of uh, start that process. We've got things going on to kind of make that transition a little smoother. Um, and she's already like, you know, agreed to sort of like continue, continue to help me through the process. Um, but yeah, that is going to be a new change for our library. Um, yeah, so are there any questions about that? I know it's kind of uh, new stuff, but I'm excited about it. Um, and yeah, it, it'll it'll just be nice to sort of have that um, sort of that like listed uh, leadership um, in the library so that like people who might be interested in OER on campus who don't really know what's happening um, sort of campus wide. Um, might be able to make connections that way as well. Uh, what an exciting bombshell. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. All right. Well, that's basically it. Um, we can take questions now if you have any or comments, general feelings. I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right, well, we haven't had any questions come up in the chat that y'all haven't already um, addressed. So I'm gonna do one last call for questions uh, and give you all a moment, do that awkward thing, wait to see if typing is happening. And I talk and I say, hey, May. <laughs> I hope May feels better. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording and thank Melody and Sam and thank all of you for joining us today. Yay. Yeah.